Hey guys, Andy here, and welcome to a brand new episode of Q and Andy Japandi, where I answer your questions about life in Japan. And all these questions today come from you guys. So if y'all like your questions answered here on the channel, be sure to leave a little some some in the comments down below in the boopy boops, and your questions could very well be in the next video. So we got a whole mess of questions from Zimzam, as well as ending things off with a question from Ray. So with that said, let's begin. So question number one from Zimzam. Would you consider doing English teaching? Well, funny you should ask, because since graduating from Lakeland University of Japan, I have been applying to a lot of different uh, English teaching schools. I've had a few interviews here and there, but nothing really substantial has come of it, i.e. a job offer. So um, I'll be talking more about jobs in Japan in a future video, so stay tuned for that. So question number two, did you go see any fireworks this summer? Sadly, I did not. This summer, 2022, woo, was the first summer that had uh, fireworks back in Japan since the uh, before times. And the schedule of events for things um, was kind of poorly distributed. So I only found out about fireworks festivals, Hanabi in Japanese, I only found out about those after the fact, when I saw all the pictures on Instagram, I was like, shit, why did nobody invite me? Why didn't I hear about this? What the hell's going on? It was kind of, I guess like poor distribution or just me not looking because I'm so preconditioned to live events not happening. Um, but next next summer, I do plan on going to some fireworks uh, festivals. And I've also gone, uh, when I was stationed in Yokosuka, I went to go see the Friendship Day fireworks from the comfort and convenience of my own balcony overlooking Tokyo Bay. So it was a wonderful place to uh, look at the fireworks as they're cracking off over the water. Um, but as far as current fireworks festivals, I haven't. Well, aside from going to Oiso and shooting up some fireworks with my friends. So question number three, would you consider doing a Japanese study course that also supplies a study visa? That was also another avenue I was considering, especially considering that a lot of the jobs out here in Japan, once you know it, require some level of Japanese. So that was something I was considering because I've always wanted to uh, get a bit serious about learning Japanese. You know, I do like some casual studying here and there, but nothing all that serious. But I do want to get serious about learning Japanese at some point. Uh, and I thought that signing up for like a Japanese study course uh, would definitely help me with that. But the problem with that, of course, is uh, money, of which I don't have quite that much. And also, even if I did, I also had to consider uh, money for living expenses as well. So it's just a lot of, of financial investment that I just don't have the means for <laughs> right now. Um, in the future, once uh, I get myself financially figured out, would that be a possibility? Of course. Like I said, I do have an interest in studying Japanese a bit more seriously, uh, but for now, the best I can do is uh, just self-study. And question number four, when do you think Japan will open to tourists? Well, I think this has been the big question that everybody's been asking everybody who lives in Japan. And to be honest, man, it's been, what, two going on three years at this point? And I know there's gonna be some people in the comments that are gonna be like, well, technically Japan is open to tourist groups and all that, so technically Japan is, it is open to tourists, so be polite, okay? But I know what y'all mean. So as far as completely unsupervised, just fly into Japan and go do Japan things, levels of opening the country up, I wouldn't hold your breath. It's been quite some time and just when Japan is looking to open the country up, something happens and they just completely forget about the whole situation. All right, and question number five, how is dating in Japan? Now, this is a very good question and it's also one that I get asked a lot of. Um, and to be honest, um, believe it or not, I don't have a whole lot of experience with, uh, with any sort of serious dating 
in Japan. You know, I've had a couple casual relationships here and there, but nothing too serious. So I can't really comment on uh, dating life in Japan just yet. Um, I've just been a little too serious about school and obviously with the you know what, I uh, kind of put a damper on, on those things, especially. As things progress and uh, I get a little more of that XP, I think uh, I'll be sure to share my experiences with y'all as well. So question number six, do I game on consoles or PC? Well, both, technically. I have a couple Steam games on my laptop that I play from time to time, as well as my Nintendo Switch off in the corner. I don't know if you can see it. It's like, I guess it's a little off screen, but it's just sitting there uh, collecting dust right now. <laughs> I do game from time to time, but uh, especially as a dude in his mid thirties, uh, it's kind of hard for me to uh, really focus on games these days. Um, it's just a lot of games nowadays either require just a huge time investment in order to get somewhat decent at it or you know you just get completely mauled by five-year-olds and it's like where's the fun in that right i don't really give a shit about the online multiplayer and all that stuff i'd rather just kind of play in my own little insular bubble just doing single player games that's that's more my speed so a lot of the stuff that i play these days is fairly casual stuff you know, like Pokemon. I've been playing a lot of the Yu-Gi-Oh games as well. Uh, stuff like that. So nothing too serious gaming wise. Question number seven. What do you love about Akihabara? Well, there is a lot to love about Akihabara. It's considered by many to be the otaku mecha, nerd mecha of Japan. And it's certainly well earned that reputation. However, while I do recommend uh, first time visitors to Japan to at least give old Akiba a visit just to kind of see the sights and go in the stores and stuff like that. And it does have a, a pretty big selection of things. I would highly recommend instead going to Nakano Broadway once you've gotten your Akiba fill. So Nakano Broadway is a shopping center in, well, Nakano in Tokyo that specializes in a lot of otaku goods and collectibles and all kinds of stuff. And the difference between Nakano Broadway and Akiba is Akiba is more geared towards like uh, the high selling merchandise of things. So yeah, there are some stores that do specialize in retro goods, you know, retro video games, like uh, most famously Super Potato, the huge retro video game store. And um, there's a couple of, you know, hidden mom and pop shops here and there as well. But for the most part, uh, Akiba gears towards the uh, super otaku in like idol anime and like MMORPGs, things like that, stuff that has a lot of uh, res resale value. So if you're looking for like Dragon Ball Z, Sailor Moon, uh, and some like the old school Pokemon stuff, you'll find it, but it's not gonna be as plentiful as you think. Whereas if you go to Nakano Broadway, they have a lot of vintage stuff, not just Japanese vintage stuff, but also a lot of American stuff as well. Like I was very surprised to see a lot of old Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle action figures and stuff like that there as well. I really felt like a kid in a candy store back in the 90s, just going through all the shelves of uh, old toys and stuff like that. For first timers coming to Japan, I definitely re recommend visiting Akiba at least once just to see it. But when you're all done with that, go to Nakano Broadway for the real otaku experience. So question number eight, what are your favorite food items at Saizeria, Gusto, Matsuya, and 7-Eleven? Well, that's a whole bevy of places there. So uh, to be honest, I haven't really visited Saizeria or Gusto in some time. I think like the last time I was at Saizeria was when I was stationed in Yokosuka, to be honest. Um, and I ordered some stuff off of Gusto from Uber Eats like many months ago. And uh, to be honest, I wasn't really all that impressed. I mean, it's good cheap food, but uh, they're not very popular in the area of Japan that I'm at. But if I'm more in, into like the city of Tokyo, then there's a lot more of, of those places. Uh, as far as Matsuya goes, haven't really been to a true Matsuya in some time. Matsuya specializes in like beef bowls, things like that. Um, but I do love going to one of Matsuya's offshoot restaurants called Matsunoya. And they specialize in tokatsu or a pork cutlet. So I featured that in my day in the life of a study abroad student in Tokyo, Japan video, where I go to this restaurant that has like the pork cutlets and uh, 
miso soup and stuff like that off to the side. Really good stuff, and especially if you're on a budget, like as a student or as a uh, budget conscious traveler, definitely recommend it. You can order all the stuff from the uh, little kiosk, so you don't even have to talk to anybody. Uh, they have an English menu, which is pretty good, so definitely can't recommend it enough, for sure. And as for 7-Eleven, I mostly just go there for breakfast food, to be honest, because I just go there for, uh, you know, either coffee or Monster energy drinks or uh, whatever, and then I go get my uh, sandwiches. So they are very famous for having, like, seasonal sandwiches. So every once in a while you get, like, this new sort of promotional food. And I try them, and sometimes they're pretty good. Other times it's just like, eh. So that's kind of the uh, the gamble you take when uh, getting these uh, seasonal food items. Uh, but the thing that I always get there pretty consistently is the uh, the tuna sandwich roll. So it's basically uh, tuna salad in a hot dog bun, and it sounds pretty plain. And by itself, it, it generally is. It's also pretty cheap too. I think it's actually as cheap or cheaper than onigiri. So like 110, 12 yen, so like less than a dollar uh, can get you one of these guys. And the thing I like about it is that it does leave a lot of room for extra ingredients. So you can add like extra mayo, you can add hot sauce. Um, if you're fancy, you can add a bunch of other stuff to it as well. So it just leaves you a lot of uh, open space. You know, it's basically a, a blank canvas of food. So question number nine, what's your favorite supermarket? Well, there's not a whole lot of uh, supermarket selections where I'm at, just because I'm in a uh, quieter part of Kawasaki, just south of Tokyo. But the most popular one out here would have to be Life Supermarket. Uh, that's usually where I go to get uh, chili ingredients. So I just grab a whole bunch of stuff, take it back home, cook it in the Instant Pot, and uh, it is so good. Pour it over rice because, you know, you can't really get the bulk of ingredients like you could back in America. So often fill it out with rice and uh, it seems pretty apropos because you know when in Japan right add rice to stuff <laughs> and it's not so bad actually uh, but in addition to, to foodstuffs uh, they also have some uh, kitchenware and all kinds of other stuff on the second floor as well and if you go to like the really big ones uh, they may have even a wider selection of things and in addition to life um, even though it's not technically a supermarket, it's somewhere in between a supermarket and a convenience store. Uh, I definitely want to recommend My Basket as well because they have stuff that's cheaper than a kombini but not quite as cheap as a discount supermarket. And they have a, a pretty good selection of, of food items. Um, I really like them for their salads because I go to the, the kombini and try to get a salad because, you know, I try to eat right <laughs> sometimes. Their salad selection's pretty paltry, in my opinion. Uh, but going to my basket, they have like this whole big bowl of salad and you can get an extra little packet of greens for like 100 some yen. Um, just that and some basic salad dressing and you're good to go for probably like uh, 300, 400 yen, if that. And they also have a lot of selections of the same stuff you'll find in Kaminis, but for significantly less. So that's really good, especially if you're on a budget. So question number 10, the perfect 10. Do you use the bidet in Japanese bathrooms? Well, of course I do. But unfortunately, uh, the guest house where I'm staying at now does not have a bidet. But uh, once I save up enough money for my own Japanese apartment, I'm going to be looking to change that. I'm going to be looking for one that does have a bidet because in addition to it being healthier than uh, just standard toilet paper, it also saves you a lot of money. It's more, you know, ecological because you're using less paper and it's just healthier because you get all the uh, the biddlies off versus just standard paper. So yes, cannot recommend bidets enough. In fact, a uh, funny story, when I came back to America after living in Japan when I was stationed in Yokosuka, I ended up buying the little attached mechanical bidets that you could get off of Amazon for like 50 bucks. And I remember getting one of the fancy ones for my folks for Christmas, just as kind of like a, a funny little gift, you know, because sometimes I like to do that for my folks, you know, just get something that's a little odd, but oddly useful as well. Like I remember coming home for Christmas one year and getting my stepdad a, a calculator that's made of bamboo 
because he was always complaining that you know he was counting stuff and he didn't want to like pull out his phone and it's just like you know i wish i had a calculator with me and i was like okay <laughs> you know so i went to don quixote donkey and picked up a bamboo calculator and he still uses it even after all this time so you know it's one of those kind of odd sort of gifts but still very useful and so i just got them a, uh, a fancy bidet seat and attached it they were a little hesitant but uh once the uh the you know what hit and there was tp shortages they found it uh invaluable so question number 11 when's mr peachy coming back well Soon. Cool. So question number 12, where's the best Tex-Mex food in Tokyo? Now, to be quite honest, Tex-Mex food in Japan is very hard to find. And when you find a really good place, it's like finding a wild unicorn. They're often very good, but because of the limited appeal of Tex-Mex food in Japan, uh, they often close shop just as quickly as you find it. So I could honestly make like a whole series on finding like the best Tex-Mex food in Japan, food for thought. I would say as far as the restaurants that are consistently here, uh, namely the chains, um, well, of course you have Taco Bell, but I know that's not what y'all came here to hear. Uh, but there are a lot of Taco Bell restaurants out in Tokyo, namely. There are in other parts of Japan as well, but most of them are in Tokyo. But in addition to Taco Bell and a lot of the little mom and pop shops, some of the best ones I've had recently was a shop out in Akasaka called Tacos Rico. I'm not sure if that one's a chain or not, but it reminds me a lot of Chipotle just in the setup of things. Uh, the food quality is pretty good. And considering how pricey uh, Mexican food can be in Japan, considering it's, you know, foreign food, technically, it's pretty reasonably priced. And even for the sizes and stuff you get, it's, it's pretty reasonable. In addition to that, there's 440 Broadway, which has a taco truck that's usually set up outside of National Azabu, which is an import shop, but it also has its own fixed location out in Shibuya as well. And their setup is not quite as intricate as Tacos Rico, but the food there is bomb. The last place I'll recommend just off the top of my head would be another common chain out in Japan called Guzman y Gomez. Uh, they're a really good chain. Uh, they have some alcoholic bevies as well. So if you want to get your drink on, in addition to getting some good Tex-Mex food, uh, definitely recommend checking those out as well. So question number 13, what's the best pizza in Tokyo? Except Saizaria, of course, of course. <laughs> um, there's a lot of little mom and pop shops out in Tokyo and elsewhere in Japan that do pizza pretty good, I gotta say. But a lot of it is namely geared towards like the stone bake type pizza, which is good. I like stone bake. But if you're looking for that Merkin pizza, then there's two places that I can't recommend enough. One of those is Devil Craft Pizza. It has several shops out in Tokyo and it specializes in the Chicago deep dish style pizza. And they also have just a huge selection of craft beer as well. Now, I will say this place is a little pricey, but considering the uh, the swim from Tokyo to Chicago versus paying a little extra for a pizza, you can kind of see the uh, price and time disparity, if you will. And it is really good. I do think you do get your money's worth for it, but just be warned, it's it's not exactly wallet or waste friendly. Now, in addition to Devil Craft Pizza, I also would highly recommend The Pizza Slice. Uh, their main shop is out in Shibuya, but I have heard that there's a couple other places in Tokyo as well. Uh, the one in Shibuya is the only one that I know of off the top of my head though. Uh, but they specialize in New York style pizza. So if you're a fan of the, the thinner foldable pizza, um, definitely check that out. Uh, I think it's a pretty good value. It's certainly uh, a lot more budget friendly than uh, the uh, Devil Craft Pizza, just because you can buy it by the slice. So if you're only just a little hungry, you can go to uh, the Pizza Slice, grab you a slice, get a drink, and uh, still be uh, reasonably fed, if I do say so myself. Question number 14. Am I planning a trip back home? Well, sorry mom, not anytime soon. 
unfortunately. Uh, just with the uh, current American inflation going on right now, plane ticket prices have gone to some pretty ridiculous um, heights, if you will. And just looking at, at the prices of things and, and what I have in savings, I'm not going to be planning a trip anytime soon. It's just, it's too expensive. And also, I don't have my driver's license anymore. So my vacation back in America isn't going to be all that eventful, really. Because, you know, I do love my folks, but I do also want to visit my friends as well. And it kind of feels weird as a 36-year-old man being like, Mom, can you take me over to Eric's, please? Like, who does that, man? That's weird. So, I'd say, you know, not going to be in, in the in the the near future, to be honest, uh, just because of the price and the fact that I can't drive anymore in America. So, um, I do want to go back eventually, of course, but I'm just going to wait for things to calm down price-wise before planning any sort of trip back home. Sorry, Mom. Question number 15. How many people stay in your guest house? Are they all foreigners or Japanese too? Well, it's kind of a mix of, of people at my guest house. Um, as far as the amount of people, I'd say probably about 30 or 40, maybe a little more, a little less. Uh, we have a lot of people kind of coming and going at this guest house. But uh, as far as the, the demographics of things, uh, it's mostly Indians. Uh, just because there's a good um, engineering school nearby. So a lot of them just kind of go there, go through their engineering program, and then once they're done, they either get jobs in Tokyo and move out, or they go back home to India. So again, there's a lot of turnover at this guest house, so it's hard to uh, to make friends in that, in that way. Um, but as far as are there any Japanese, uh, there's a few Japanese people here too, but uh, it rhymed. <laughs> But uh, it is mostly foreigners and primarily Indians. So I'm one of the very few Americans living here. In fact, I, th I think I'm the only American living here. There might be like one other, I'm not sure, but uh, I'm pretty sure I'm the only American living here, which is uh, interesting to say the least. But, you know, I like this guest house because, you know, it's my own private room and it's fairly close by to, to Tokyo. So the commutes, not too bad and uh, it's a fairly cheap price so what you gonna do and the last question question number 16 comes from ray how do you feel your life would be different if you were able to make it to temple university japan well i'd say that's a fantastic question and i've really had some time to to think about this one because there's a lot that would have changed had i got accepted into temple versus continued on with my education at Lakeland. Uh, one of the main things would have been that um, I'd be a lot closer to the campus. <laughs> That's another reason why I moved to my guest house is that it's fairly close to Temple. Um, another thing is they would have done in-person classes a lot sooner, for better or worse. I've kind of come to like the uh, Zoom classes after a while. It just kind of is what it is. But uh, it is nice to not have to get up early in the morning and deal with all that commuter traffic gotta say uh, but as far as other aspects of my life had I been accepted into the temple one of the things that I really missed out on that I wish I would have gotten uh, would have been to work with more filmmaker type people uh, over at Lakeland there really isn't like a filmmaker type scene out there it's mostly just people kind of going through their education there's not really any sort of groups Really, I mean, there's like friend groups and stuff, but you know, I don't really feel like there's clubs or anything like that going on over at Lakeland for the most part. Whereas Temple actually does have clubs and going out and doing stuff. And you know, I'm friends with a lot of Temple alum, so they tell me stories about their experiences over at Temple, for better or worse. But as far as the, uh, the filmmaker path goes, there's a huge club involved with that mostly people making like uh, short films things like that and I think I really would have uh, flourished as a, uh, a filmmaker <laughs> if I uh, got accepted over to Temple and gotten to work on all kinds of, of different projects I think 
it would have really made me a much better video editor, much better videographer, and just better at what I do overall. But I'd say, all things considered, it is what it is. Everything that has happened has led me to this point, making this video right here. So, as the Japanese would say, shogunai, my guy. It is what it is. So yeah, those were 16 questions talking about life out here in Japan. And once again, guys, if you have any questions about life in Japan, be sure to leave them in the comments down below in the booby boops and your questions could be in the next video, just like these guys. So looking forward to reading your questions in the next video. And with that said, this is Andy, sign up for now. And as always, forever, we'll see you next time. <laughs> Catch you later, guys. Bye.